You're listening to Sacks in the Basement, a production of the Broadcast Basement Limited, where every show is 30 minutes of good and comes from a basement bar on the south side of Chicago. Pull up a stool, pour a cold one, and join us right now for Sacks in the Basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always at SacksInTheBasement.com. Doing the show slightly differently today. Uh, we're going to be in uh, two different studios, mirroring each other, because uh, I couldn't get Ed over to the bar, mainly because I spent the entire weekend at a hockey tournament in Madison, Wisconsin, and I uh, watched Brother Rice's JV and varsity teams play. My kids on the JV team, but both teams were in the same hotel, uh, <laughs> traveling up from the south side, Ed, to go play in a hockey tournament. It was a fun weekend. It was an exhausting weekend. And I'm going to do this with you and pass out. That sounds like a reasonable plan to just go ahead and, and oh. you know, fake it till you make it for <laughs> about 30 minutes of White Sox baseball and then turn around and become comatose for the next 24 hours. Right. And, and that's exactly what I'm going to end up doing here. One, fun time. Two, they played great. Three, uh, parents drink way too much. You, you immediately, like the team parents, I, I mean, the amount of booze they went through. In the- You're also in Madison, yeah, Wisconsin. There's nothing to do. And, and I'm not here to bag on Wisconsin, although I, <laughs> I often do. But what else? Really, what else are you guys going to do when, when you're out there? It's not like the parents are going to be like, all right, two hockey teams from a high school. <laughs> Stay here under your own supervision. We're going to go out and do right, something cultural right. and artistic. Oh, well, they kept they kept trying to come up with, like, fun things to do, but everything just led back to the parents going, okay, where, where are we going to go get some drinking done? Like, I mean, that's just... It, yeah. It, it, we, all, we all acted like we were, we were like, college kids or early 20 or 20s kids, right? Like, you know, when I was young, I can't do that anymore. I mean, seriously. Well, if it makes a, you feel any better, the uh, Special Olympics Regional Basketball Tournament I was at on Sunday morning, we did the exact same thing. I mean, it was, was big just, drinking. Well, hold on a second. There was big drinking at the Special Olympics Regional Basketball? Uh, drinking, not so much, but maybe <laughs> other things. Uh, okay. All right. All right. All right. We, had a, we had fun weekends, that's for sure. There we go. Uh, the White Sox did some international signings, which I think is really nice, and they took care of their, their arbitration guys right before they would have had to start going to a hearing. They settled with everybody. That's, that's all wonderful news. That's a good thing. I'm concerned about the idea, though, that you probably have about $2.5 million of international money left. And I don't know what you're saving it for. If I mean, like on one hand, I'm happy that I see a bunch of names. We, we've we've talked about that on this show before. We've had guests on that have talked about it before. That the White Sox philosophy over the last couple of years of getting the big name guys like a Luis Robert means they have far less guys in their system uh, than say the Padres who go out and just spend a bunch of money, sign a bunch of small contracts in those international pools, and then have a lot of capital when they want to make a trade. So on one hand. I liked the idea of spreading it out. On the other hand, I would have liked to have seen another five names on there because you got two and a half million dollars that you didn't use. Well, and and to your point, are there not three, four or five other guys out there that are deserving of of, of a dart throw? Anybody. It's it's, it's money that you're going to spend anyway or that you would have spent. Can you just throw a dart, see if one of these guys turns into something? And that's what you're doing. And that's what, you know, signing multiple guys is is all about and you know obviously the big name that everyone's going to talk about is uh you know Juan Uribe Jr. who is literally from Chicago but you know still um you're, you're you've got some legacy there but there's other things you know you can read up on on you know Denny Lima and Abraham Nunez and Alberto Albert Alberto who's a that's gonna be a fun one to say uh, D'Angelo Tejada, Rafael Alvarez, and you know, then you've got uh, Luis Reyes, who's the number forty-one prospect, who's actually the big one that they signed. So, because that's that's one of the top fifty. So you've got you know, you're signing talent, you're signing a bunch of players, and yeah, do you really need to leave the two and a half million? Is there somebody else that they're waiting for? Is there uh, a group of guys that you know they're not gonna? You know they're not going to put money towards, or is the pool that shallow this year? And I, I can't believe it's the last one. I can't believe that it's just there's not enough players out there that are worth throwing into the system to see if they develop. Listen, sixteen and seventeen year old kids that you select in this international signing period, right? They turn into nineteen year old prospects that you throw into trades. I mean, that, that's what they are. They, they, most of them never even make it 
to the point where the where you're even considering that they could be major league baseball players when you're signing them at that at that the, that lower level talent and those really young kids, you're just grabbing capital, right? You're just getting pieces that you may be able to turn around and flip when you need to make a deal at some point because somebody else scouted the kid and was like, you know what, we think that kid's pretty good. And it doesn't matter what they are now, it matters what they are in a couple of years when they're still way too young to make it to the majors, but there's something that you can move. And that that's the only thing that uh, whenever you hear a criticism about how they handle international signings, it's that they don't add to that pool of just really young kids that a couple of years later after they've been in their system or they've been under their watchful eye now becomes a, a prospect that gets added into a deal where you're dealing three guys off for one, right? Because some team is like, yeah, throw in that kid too. We like what we've seen out of him over the last couple of years since you signed him with that international money. So that's the only reason why I kind of sit back and go, wow, it just feels like it feels like a missed opportunity, a waste of resources. I don't know how exactly to do it, how exactly to say it, except if there is something down the pipe, if they have a feeling that somebody's going to become available that they're still going to be able to go and get, and that's why they're holding on to that money, or they're going to use that money. But I, 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 to me, it just seems like just sign a bunch of guys at this point, right? If there wasn't a big name and you don't have a big name that you, you know you're holding that for, just fill up your system with all those really young players that can later be flipped. Yeah, if there's no projectable superstar, if there's no if there's no one that is the Luis Robert who you're sitting there going, this guy this guy has the opportunity to be an absolute game changer, a dynamic player, then you're just looking for Kenny Williams' favorite thing. You're looking for athletes, you're looking for projectable physical skill. That's something, I mean, honestly, that's got to be like what Kenny Williams does when he's feeling lonely at night, is he just goes and he looks for projectable <laughs> athletic skill he's just scrolling through a list somewhere trying yeah. to figure out like are they the right body type Ooh. and do they have like this really great athleticism i don't this even guy know he's got strong wrists this guy's never used a baseball in his life he plays a completely different sport but we think we can make him into but, a second but look baseman. at but look at the calves <laughs> look, at, look at how fast he can sprint and accelerate uh, this episode of Socks in the Basement and every episode of Socks in the Basement brought to you by our proud sponsors, uh, the home of the podcast for fans, by fans, Cork and Carey at the park. Uh, they're over at 33rd in Princeton, in the shadow of the ballpark. They have an award-winning menu of burgers and ballpark favorites, two-for-one burgers when you dine in on Monday's non-Socks home games, extensive bar with a rotation of craft beers, familiar favorites, spirits, and wines. They are your home base for White Sox pre, post, and uh, viewing parties. So uh, just make sure... You, you make plans when you're getting down there this summer because I'm telling you, this is where I bring the whole family before I even walk into the ballpark. And, and I'm able to get them some food. I'm able to have a beer. I'm able to get into the atmosphere of the whole thing. And then I mosey my way over to the ballpark and continue to look for the pretzel rod, which I'm never going to find, right? No, so I, no, I'm just going to get, gonna get burgers at Cork and Gary at the park. That's what I'm going to do. And I that's a better trade because what, what I've heard from people who got the pretzel wrap brought, it's all right. Yeah, it's nothing, nothing special for what you spent. I'd, I'd rather go get, I'd rather go get, frankly, a pl plate of wings and a burger from Cork and Carry at the park, than search around for this elusive brat. I don't think I don't even think it exists. I think it's a, it, it, somehow it's a, somehow it's a trick that's being played on me. And at this point, I'm no longer at this point I'm no longer interested in it. Anyway, you know, I, mean, I, I, I think whatever. if you get one, you actually have to put like a plate of like helmet nachos on the thing where the pretzel brat is to try and balance out the weight. And if you don't get it right, a large boulder comes down and chases you out into left field. <laughs> I, I don't think the fundamentals deck exists. I think it's just a transport ramp for a large boulder. If you do find the pretzel, brat. Ah, right, that makes sense. Uh, here's a, there's a list out of uh, that has, includes some white Sox players. And I love whenever prospect list comes out. And this one's an interesting one because it's a fantasy baseball prospect list. And, and, and the reason that I find these interesting, and I always say this on the show, one, I like fantasy baseball. I know we're getting ready to have our winter meetings in our dynasty league where there's going to be trades everywhere, and we're getting ready. We're gearing up for our season. It's almost like a year-round thing. I mean, there, there were deals being made last month in this league, right? But So I, I love trolling for the prospects so that I can add them to my team, and years later, all of a sudden, I have Vladimir Guerrero Jr. as my first baseman. Like, I mean, like this is the kind of thing I get into. But this list is interesting to me for a couple of reasons. One, uh, the list on CBSSports.com right now uh, will, it, it, it basically says right there on the top of it, take out defense. The only way defense becomes a factor here in this list, because we're talking fantasy, 
is if it's going to keep the guy off the field from regular playing time or he's got a hole in his glove and that's why we think he'll never get promoted. That otherwise, these are the guys that are on the list solely for their bat and for what they can do offensively. And there's two White Sox players on there. And the other interesting thing about it before I get to the two names on the list and where they rank in this top 100 list is that the list is is taking into an account that the player should get here relatively soon. Like, if not showing up at some point at the end of this season, let's say, getting a cup of coffee, definitely in the mix to make it to the majors next year. So the first name I want to point out is at number 40, and this is the lower of the two White Sox players. The number 40 player is Oscar Colas, and that makes sense to me because when it comes to Oscar Colas, we're expecting him to be playing right field. I know that's what I'm thinking. I'm figuring he's the right fielder. Is 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 that your assumption as well? Yeah, that's my assumption. My right. my assumption is, well, you know, what, what they say on the list here is he's fighting for a job this spring. So my assumption is if he shows up, shows off his talent, uh, you know, does well in spring training, doesn't show any obvious flaws. Like if he goes up there and strikes out every at bat, okay, and, and goes like oh for the entire spring, there's no way they're promoting him. It's just not going to happen. But if he goes and he hits like the rest of the regulars are hitting – and shows showcases what he can do, uh, especially if he actually hits some home runs and stuff like that and shows the power, which is what we're expecting from him, then, yeah, I absolutely expect him to break camp, be the starting right fielder, and make it so that, you know, when we're talking about fourth outfielders, we're talking about Gavin Sheets, we're talking about, you know, somebody who is a, a Billy Hamilton or a, a lesser minor leaguer that we're not expecting necessarily to see break camp. And have that starting outfield of Benintendi, Robert, Colas, and really, you know, that he is going to be an everyday contributor. How much? I don't know that I want to project him to sit there and say that coming off of a minor league year where under 481 at-bats, he hit 314 with 23 homers and 895 OPS, walked 38 times, struck out 120 times. I think the strikeouts will be higher. I think the walks will be a little bit lower. I think the OPS will be a little bit lower because that's what happens to rookies. But I think he's he's got that talent that this is what we're excited about. This is why somebody like Oscar Colas gets the big contract, you know, and gets the opportunity to come here and they spend the money on him uh, because we in the international market. You're talking player. international yeah. money. His, his deal was big for international. That's for that's big for, sure. for international. They, they, that's yeah. what I meant. Big for international yeah. money. Uh, and obviously, not the richest contract in White Sox history, which goes to Andrew Benintendi <laughs> and and possibly most of the ushers at this point because of the amount of money not thrown around by the Sox over the last 40 years. Listen, uh, the thing I find the most interesting, though, is that they're trying to evaluate, is he going to make an impact this year? Like, should you put this guy on your fantasy team because he's going to put up good offensive numbers? And I like the I like the point where that they make that he always hit over 300, like at all of his stops at, at all three stops in the minor leagues, hitting over 300 at every spot. Plus, showing a lot of power with 16 home runs in his final 54 games. And they say that leaves little doubt he's ready for the next challenge. They're basically telling you, if you're looking to put this guy into your fantasy team, he's going to score you points because he's going to have good offensive output. So their their assumption, at least evaluating him for this purpose, is that he is going to translate to the majors. I mean, I think you're right about the strikeouts. I think he's going to be higher on strikeouts. And a guy who only had 38 walks compared to 120 strikeouts, I, that, that gap probably widens even more. So that may get a little frustrating. But if you can get a guy, I mean, let's say he hit, he hit over two, 290 at every stop, right? What if he comes out of here and hits 280 for you in, in his rookie year, or 270 for you in his rookie year in, in, in Major League Baseball? 270, 20 home runs. 20 home runs and, and plays right field and supposedly is a, is a, is a good defender out there. You're going to take that from a rookie. I'm good. Yeah, and you're not really relying on him to be up at the top of your order, are you? You, you, No. This guy's at the bottom of your order. This this guy's towards the bottom. He's in one of the final three spots in the lineup when he comes up. That's where Andrew Benintendi becomes important because when we were talking about Oscar Colas at the beginning of the offseason being one of their outfielders and we're looking at the other outfielder being Gavin Sheets or we're looking at you know whoever is internal that they could put out there, you look at it and you go, okay, Colas has to hit 270 to 280. He has to hit 20 plus home runs. He has to, you know, keep the strikeouts in check. He's got to get on base because he's got to be one of your top five hitters. Now he doesn't have to be. You know, now he can, he, you can bat him seventh and let him, let him grow. 
you know, let him let him do it and have, you know, the best seventh or eighth hitter in the league, <laughs> you know, for that matter, or the one of the more dangerous ones anyway, if not the best. But th- yeah, I, I think it's, I think it's important you see him on this list and sit there and say, yes, he's going to he's got a chance to make an immediate impact. And that would be huge for the Sox. Before we get to the other name on the list and what they said, uh, I just want to remind all of you out there, if you got mom or dad, grandma or grandpa switching to a new age of life, you're trying to keep them out of assisted living, or let's say you spend an entire weekend drinking like you were 25 and you're 45 like me and everything hurts. Maybe you need the house set up a little bit so you don't fall down because I almost did it three times just coming down here to the bar today. That's how tired I am. Uh, But if you're in need of medical equipment, in all seriousness, Hyatt Home Medical Equipment down in Evergreen Park has a big, beautiful showroom. They have everything from the latest in CPAP technology for those with sleep apnea to uh, diabetes control. Uh, They they have lifts that get you from one floor to another floor. They can set up the house like a smart home with the touch of a button on an app. You can open and close and lock doors. Uh, you You can basically set the house up to be so safe you'll never consider leaving leaving the house. A lot of people want to stay in their home as they get into an advanced age or if they've had like a procedure or surgery, something like that, and it's a little bit tougher to get around, Hyatt can help you out. See all that they can do at hhme.com. Mention Socks in the Basement, get additional money off, and they'll work with your insurance. Or stop in today and see them, ask any question you want at 3518 West 95th Street in Evergreen Park. The number 35 player on this list who's sitting five spots of, in front of Oscar Colas, is a Colson Montgomery. Now, I want to read what they said about him, and then I want to go back to the point that I made right at the very beginning of this when we looked at this list, uh, that I want, I want to remind you of something here. Here's what they said about him first. Uh, they show that he's uh, 21 on opening day this year. His highest level is A. They put out his minor league stats, and they read it like this. Though Montgomery was selected 18 picks after Marcelo Mayer in 2021, the Corey Seager comp could apply just as easily to him. Seeing as he bats left-handed, stands an imposing six foot four, and has a swing geared for line drives. The move up the double A late in the year tripped him up a little, but his first full season went so well overall that he's verging on elite prospect status. And they've said, maybe he gets a late season look. I don't know if that's really something that's realistic, but this guy's moving along in the system. And for them to put him on the list, again, this is, this is in the prism of when he comes up, he's going to get regular playing time because they, they otherwise he wouldn't be very useful on this prospect list. And he's coming, if not this year, next year, because that's kind of how far out they're looking when they describe why they're doing these rankings in this order. He's higher up on this list than he is on the MLB pipeline list that's currently out. I think that's going to change. He's going to be way up on that list. I think he was in the 50s at the end of the season and he may he may be a, a 30 or you know even high, even higher up than 35 like on this on this fantasy baseball list. But this is the prospect right now in the system that is starting to get all the national attention when people put out lists like this. Yeah, and and for comparison what they're saying about Marcelo Meyer of the Red Sox is a, a guy that's only in low A high A last year. Stats are comparable to Colson Montgomery's. Uh, but they say considered by many to be the top talent in the 2021 draft. Myers' polish is evident, and he should have a relatively easy and straightforward climb to the majors. Corey Seager remains the go-to comp with an expectation Meyer will hit for both average and power from the left side of the plate and possibly turn out to be more of a base dealer than expected. So sit there and say same Z's for Colson Montgomery and consider that he's a year sooner into the into the majors because he has progressed a little bit faster. Yeah, he's in double A. Yeah, because because of the Birmingham experiment last year, that was one of the things that they did. Right, he never. Yeah, well, that was the reason. That's why he was up. You know, they kind of they kind of failed to mention that. That's why he was up with this whole Project Birmingham thing. But you know, I, I think that was probably good for him. That that seemed like that that idea to get them all together underneath the same tutelage. I thought that was pretty smart what they ended up doing. I always I thought that was a you know you always look for your team to start thinking outside the box or doing something different. And I always find that to be a positive if it works or doesn't work because you're just not doing the same old thing. But he did get a taste of double A last year. And the the belief is that he's going to continue to move quickly through this system, which is interesting because I don't know. What does he become? Do you think that he starts off moving into the third base position if they if they're having a problem uh, getting you on Moncada going? Does he go and stand at second base next year and then eventually transition over to short if and when T.A. moves on? Once, once his option years are out, because I would imagine he's going to go out and try to get paid. And I don't know, you know, the White Sox is their biggest contract is is five years and seventy five million dollars. I don't know, I don't know if TA is going to want that, right? 
So, I mean, like, it is what do you think the plan is for him? Because he may not start at short, but I think he'll eventually be at short. Well, and, and that's maybe the, the situation is, is that he is he is the bat behind the glass that you need to break in case you don't have a second baseman that seems to be a fixture going forward or that, uh, you, you know, you do have more of an issue with Yohan Moncada and you can't sit there and say we're going to be able to count on this guy to do anything for us more than just play decent defense. Or maybe he really is just the heir apparent to T.A., but I really honestly think that the White Sox would make a concerted effort to try and sign Tim Anderson. I just don't know, like you said, how much he's going to be looking at the $200 million contracts that have been handed out and the $75 million that's been handed out to Andrew Benintendi as the high watermark for the White Sox and think that there's going to be a gap closure there, enough of it for Anderson. And I and also I, I think it's fair to say that – Anderson being in his 30s is going to be a different – it's going to be a different conversation than maybe you would have had with a 28-year-old Andrew Benintendi or even if Anderson was younger. But I think Montgomery, what what I would expect is that they're going to try and give him some positional versatility so that when they figure out where he is most comfortable and best at, they will build around him – in that spot. So if, if it turns out that he is a lights out third baseman, Yohan Moncada will be out of here as soon as his contract is up because Colson Montgomery, that's his spot. If he is really a, 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 you know, a top end shortstop, then that's going to impact the Tim Anderson signing and, and re-signing an extension. And if it's something where Montgomery is just, this is the second baseman of the future. Cause second base isn't, isn't a throwaway position necessarily. And it's one of those. Not anymore. Not after the shift, not after the shift rules yeah. too. You're going to have to have a better athlete at second and, base. And, and also if you are a team that has a good second baseman, you get good production out of second base. That is a huge win. It's, it should not be treated as an afterthought position just because the White Sox haven't been able to find one consistently since Tadahito Aguchi almost 20 years ago. Doesn't he though seem like the the prospect that they won't move Montgomery? Right. I, I mean, like whenever you see, whenever you see like rumors or what people are asking for or things like that, you, don't you just imagine that he's probably that guy that when a team asks about him, they're like, yeah, yeah, you, pick off this list. Like we we have plans for yeah. this guy. You know, I mean, I'm not going to sit go out and say he's untouchable, but I, I would imagine that they as an organization, knowing that they really haven't, I mean, up until this year, up until last year. When when he moved on to the onto the top 100 MLB prospect list, there had been a dry spell. A lot of that was because guys got promoted. Like they used to have a ton of them when they were in this in the in the remix, as you call it, not the rebuild. Okay, but it, they had been cleared off of that list. He's a really valuable piece, but he's also a piece that they could look at three different positions, like you just said. They still haven't figured out second base. You don't know what Tim Anderson's going to be. You know, is he still going to be around in a couple years when he gets the opportunity to go into free agency? So, and, and since he's a shortstop, he can move to either one of those positions, and he could also move over to third base, where, again, in a couple of years, if this hasn't worked out, you spent a ridiculous amount of money in the last two years of Yohan Moncada's deal, but then at some point you're going to sit there and say, that's it, right? He never, he never did anything besides what he did in 2019. And so then all of a sudden you're looking at this guy going, is he the third baseman? So he really has the ability to go anywhere. And that's probably why they sit there and say that it's hard to find that guy. And there's so many questions at those three positions. You probably want to hold that prospect if you really believe in him. Well, and, and also you do when you when you draft and when you sign international free agent stars, you know, the, the, the potential superstars and you spend big on them with that international money, of course. But when you're doing this and you're identifying top end guys, what Rick Hahn was doing, and, and again, I disagree with this philosophy as a true rebuild in the way it was sold to us, but it's not a terrible philosophy if you hit on every single one of them. When you identify certain guys, Colson Montgomery falls into that list of guys that you're going to try and build the team around, okay? Just like Luis Robert, just like Aloy Jimenez, just like Andrew Vaughn, uh, you know, and a lot like what Tim Anderson was coming out of the rebuild or, or Jose Abreu was coming, you know, into the rebuild, I should say, coming out of where their last contention, supposed contention window when they, when they sold off Chris Sale and, and Adam Eaton and everything. So you, you identify guys that you're going to build around and Colson Montgomery seems to be that guy. So no, you're not going to move him unless it is one of those things where it's like, my God, look what we're getting back, right? You're getting back. If you're getting back a generational talent that you can control for a while, 
uh, you know, like a, like a Juan Soto kind of a guy, you know, not saying that that's what it would, what it would take, but if you're getting back something that is just an immediate high impact, going to be around here, takes this team to that level and it costs you Colson Montgomery, I think the team would consider it, but I also don't know that Montgomery is high enough on the list of prospects that other teams are looking at it that way, which doesn't make him not valuable because if the White Sox had Corey Seager in his prime right now, sitting at second base or sitting at third base instead of Yohan Moncada, wouldn't they be a better team? Yes, they would be. Yes, they would be. And so like, I, he's the guy I'm, I'm paying attention to a lot when I'm not watching uh, the Major League product this year. Uh, Hailstorm Brewing Company is the official brewery of Sox in the Basement. They're in Tinley Park at 8060 186th Street, right off of 80th Avenue, and they got uh, Will Turner there. Uh, he's a year into it now. He's doing a great job with all their, their brewing. Uh, they've got some really big-time beers there. They've got uh, stouts and porters, and they've got IPAs that have won awards. Uh, it's the place to go sit down, Watch watch guys like making beer, like that's if you're into that kind of thing. And I always think that's really cool. They'll chat with you from time to time. It's a full working brewery with a beer hall type feel. And then and then it's got the the tap room right there. And everything's got this big open floor plan so you can see everything. They got music on the weekends and trivia nights in the weekdays. And, and definitely go check them out. See the entire list of everything they have to offer uh, at hailstormbrewing.com. And remember when you're over at Cork and Carry at the park. Uh, they're on tap over there as well. So Hailstorm Brewing, the official brewery of Sox in the basement. Uh, th- listen, the the arbitration things where they they came to their their quick agreement so they didn't have to go to a hearing with Giolito, Reynaldo Lopez, Dylan Cease, Kopech, and Jose Ruiz, uh, that's all good stuff. I, I, when I was looking at the list, it's interesting when you go on fan graphs, it'll tell you, all right, and then remember Giolito and Lopez become free agents next year. The other three guys still are in arbitration. They're just going into their second year of arbitration. And watch out for two new guys that would be arbitration eligible next year in Garrett Crochet and Andrew Vaughn. So uh, it's kind of it's interesting when you see that timeline sitting right out in front of you. But then the other thing that I really just can't get my mind wrapped around, uh, like I will never understand the arbitration process because I know it was year one for Dylan Cease and it's year three for Lucas Giolito. So, of course, Giolito later on is probably going to make more money at $10.4 million, but he's going to make 10 4 this year, and the best pitcher on the staff by far, Dylan Cease, is making 5 7 and it just boggles the mind where those two guys end up in the arbitration process. Well, it's because it never goes backwards. You know, when, once, once you've established a certain value in this process, you can't take it away from them. So wouldn't it be great oh, if you could? but that would be, right. well, first of all, if if I'm the MLB Players Association, and I would never allow that to be negotiated in any contract, <laughs> that would be the dumbest thing I could do is let let the uh, arbitration system allow a backslide, okay? Because um, you would have so many guys just fall off the the ledge that way because they, you know, they get in their first year of arbitration that after having a, you know, a good solid year or two, and... Uh, they win. You know, if they win a hearing or they they get a nice uh, nice contract offer from the team, that's you know market value and projectable. Yeah, they they, they turn into Yohan Mankata and fall apart. And uh, yeah, what, what are you going to do, right? But but it is it is one of those inequities that that I think drives not only fans a little batty because you sit there and go, how on earth. But it also, I think, drives teams a little bit nuts. And I think it actually drives the players themselves a little bit nuts, too, because you knew that Dylan Cease was not going to make a jump to the $10 million mark in, in his first year of arbitration, even with yeah, the He would be season. worth it. He would be worth it, but they're not going to give that yeah. to him. That's the thing. That's not how it works. Right. So you're not going to have that kind of a jump. But the fact that he's basically just under $6 million, now project that out to when he is in his last year of arbitration, like Lucas Giolito, and figure out how expensive... Dylan Cease is going to be that. He'll be expensive. He'll be expensive. But you know what? The, the, when I'm comparing them, it, you, you more want to look at where Cease and Kopech came in this year, right? Because right? Cease is 5.7 and Kopech's 3.7 million lower than him. And that, that you, I hope I get a motivated Michael Kopech this year, you know, who looks at that and goes, wait a minute. So if I, if I, if I can pitch at that same level because I think I'm good enough to be just like what Dylan Cease is, I can make that, I can, I can jump up that high or even higher in year two. Like that's, because that, there's two guys in their first year of arbitration. That's a pretty substantial thing. Cease more than double Kopech. 
But that's, I guess that's how you compare it then, right? Because then you look at it and you sit there and go, okay, well, Kopech is worth $2 million. A guy like Cease has to be worth a lot more after you see what his season was. Yeah, well, and, <laughs> you know, frankly, as a fan, I also look at that and I look at those numbers and Kopech is expected to not be behind Dylan Cease necessarily in the grand scheme of things. It was never what you no. thought, right, during no, the prospect I, the part? sale trade was supposed to bring, like, the ultimate superstars, right? Right. I mean, that was the thing. Kopech was supposed to be the bigger the bigger deal than Dylan Cease. And now as we hit year one, it is really interesting to see, like, wh- how the actual value of those guys as they get to year one of their arbitration. Yeah, and, and I'm sure, look, Kopech's injury has a lot to do with it because he, he lost time. And, you know, his usage is different than Dylan Cease's usage. But still... Uh, you know, I was, I would have anticipated if you would have told me when this all started, when Dylan Cease is acquired, when Michael Kopech's acquired that going into the 2023 season, they'd both be in the rotation. I would have said, yeah, that's, it's exactly what's supposed to be happening. If you would have said they're your number two and three starter potentially, you know, in, in terms of how the season's going to line up. Cause I, I still think that there's a chance that Lance Lynn could open the season just out of veteran status or Lucas Giolito could. But, you know, if, the, if you said they're, they're top of the rotation guys, I would have said absolutely. I, I fully expect that. If you would have said that Dylan Cease was a Cy Young runner-up and Michael Kopech barely finished the season on his feet, I would have wondered what was going on there because I would have expected the opposite to be true where I would expect Dylan Cease to still be learning at this point somewhat. And Kopech was supposed to be the guy that comes out blazing and, and is Justin Verlander at this is point. Is Michael Kopech the most interesting name in the rotation this year as a fan? I mean, yeah, you're you're looking at Clevenger going, okay, let's see with this with this deal that he has. He knows that he's got to go out and have a big year. Do we get something similar to like Johnny Cueto? We get a guy who comes in and he's he's really good, right? We get really good Mike Clevenger. Do we see Lucas Giolito make a bounce back? Which I've said, I really think that that's a possibility because he's going out in the free agency next year and this is his biggest season ever and how he performs with the White Sox, right? And, and you know, we're watching the veteran in Lance Lynn, but we kind of know what he is, and we just want to make sure that he continues to bring what he's supposed to bring to you. And you know who Dylan Cease is already, and you, the only thing that could happen is if something goes terribly wrong. Otherwise, you just basically expect him to be a stud again on the mound. So isn't Kopech the one that you're looking at at this point in his career, and you're saying, all right, let's see. I mean, is he really going to be that guy that he was touted to be or not, I, I would think this is the, this is that crossroads season for him. It has to be. Well, and, and here's the thing: we may have seen. I don't want to say we've seen the best of Lucas Giolito, but I think we've seen what he's capable of. And for him to have better numbers than his his best year is, I don't know. I don't know that it's going to be another level that he jumps to necessarily. I think Dylan Cease could make a jump up, but I think we already know where he could go. I think Lance Lynn is Lance Lynn at this point. I think Mike Clevenger is interesting because of not knowing what you're getting necessarily fully. If you're getting pre-injury Mike Clevenger, or if you're getting some diminished version of him, but also Clevenger, I don't think has another gear. I don't think he's rising up from this injury to turn into something more amazing than we've ever seen Mike Clevenger be. I think we're looking for him to be what he was, which is probably a number three cast as a number one on a questionable Cleveland team. Well, I mean, and and think about it this way. You're going to have the club option for Lynn in 24, and you're going to have Giolito and uh, Clevenger. They're, they're both going to be free agents again, right? So you, your, your whole staff, like the guys that you know are going to be around in 24 for sure are Cease and Kopech. And you would assume, Lynn, if Lynn pitches well. And you're like, yeah, we're paying that $18 million and we're bringing him back. So that's why I think I, I think he's one of those guys. Like, if you're a fan in the short term and the long term, because if he if he takes off this year, that's just going to make this really good staff look an awful lot better. And that, that's big for the White Sox chances in, in this upcoming season. But then also when you look at the long term, this is it. This is the crossroads right here. Well, and, and if he does not emerge as an ace... That's not necessarily the end of Michael Kopech. But if he doesn't emerge as a reliable two or three, meaning that he can stay on the mound, uh, he can give you a decent amount of innings, and also he is capable of dominating some of his starts, if you get those quality starts out of him, then then Michael Kopech becomes an extremely important fixture in the rotation. If he comes out and throws 120 innings and spends time on the shelf again and struggles in some of his starts and only can go four or five, then he's not 
a guy you can build around or count on. And the White Sox, to your point, may have to think about extending Lynn even if they're not really happy with him uh, because it, it's too hard to go out and fill four starters in your rotation and, and the four being you know, the three guys who leave and Lynn, Giolito, and Clevenger potentially if those guys all leave, but also trying to find somebody to upgrade over Michael Kopech because he's not, you can't count on him to be anything more than a back end starter because he's just not showing up. He's just not there. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Socks in the basement. Heard everywhere podcasts can be found and always on socksinthebasement.com.